Okay, good evening to everyone. So great to see you. Hope you're well, and thank you so much for joining us. I wish we could have had this conversation in person, but glad that despite the circumstances, we can connect in this meaningful way. And perhaps the silver lining is that you didn't have to go out on a cold night and you were able to stay in the comfort of your homes. Before we get started on our program, I wanted to mention two important items. First, I want to recognize the sadness that we're feeling and the mourning that we're in for the passing of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Zecher Tzadik Lebracha. This is such a devastating loss of a great Jewish leader who inspired our generation and I think was an unparalleled ambassador of the Jewish people for the world. And so, Yehi Zechro Baruch. Amen. Secondly, uh, tonight is November 9th, the anniversary of Kristallnacht, the horrific night on which the destruction of over 1,400 shuls and Jewish establishments began. And Beth Jacob Congregation is privileged to be participating in a powerful initiative organized by March of the Living tonight. We'll be keeping the lights of the shul on tonight together with hundreds of other shuls as a statement of solidarity in our fight against hatred and antisemitism. So just wanted to make you aware of that. Okay, so it's our honor this evening to welcome two distinguished guests who have been frequent guests of Beth Jacob, though I think this is the first time by Zoom. Uh, Michael Medved is one of the most influential political and social commentators in America today with a nationally syndicated radio talk show host, uh, radio talk show that draws a few million listeners daily. Dr. Michael Berenbaum is a highly respected historian who is the director of the Siggy Ziering Center for the Study of the Holocaust and Ethics and a professor of Jewish studies at American Jewish University. Both of our guests are uh, keen observers of the US political landscape and the American Jewish community, and not just keen observers, but both observant, both observant Jews and proud Jews. So we, we have two Michaels tonight. So I think if I was doing a program with, with each of with, with one of you, I would call each of you probably Michael, but uh, I might refer to you as, as Mr. Medved and Dr. Berenbaum, just for identification purposes. But the Mr. Medved and Dr. Berenbaum, thank you so much for joining us. And it's an honor to host you. What an honor to be part of it. Pleasure to be here. Okay, great to, great to I, have you. I have, I, I think we should note that I was probably the last speaker at Beth Jacob before the synagogue closed down to Medved, uh, to um, COVID. Yeah, it didn't close down to Medved. It didn't close, before <laughs> the synagogue was forced to close down uh, to COVID. So it's a pleasure to be back. May we all live to healthily to be back together in a post-COVID era. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hope to be back together soon. Okay, so uh, now if a couple of just um, a couple of details, if you if you want to send questions in, if you want to post questions to um, either of the panelists, uh, I ask you during the conversation or towards the end of the conversation, we'll leave some time for questions and answers, but I invite you to send your questions in via the chat platform. Um, send your questions into the chat box, either to me personally or to the group, and we'll try to get to your question. The second thing is that, as I think many of you know by now, you can press either gallery view or speaker view to, uh, you know, kind of to determine um, who you're seeing on the screen. And of course, if you want to see the speaker uh, and focus on him, then just press speaker view. Okay. We find ourselves, um, Michael and Michael, at an important moment in our, in our nation's history. In our deeply divided country, we're grappling, we're grappling with what the election means for the US, for Israel, and for our community. And when we were planning this program, we were hoping that by, by Monday, November 9th, we would have clear, uncontested election results. Well, uh, not quite. Uh, the election has been declared in favor of former Vice President Biden by the major national media outlets, but President Trump has not yet conceded and is moving ahead with lawsuits to overturn the results. And so the first question I wanted to ask our distinguished guests, and it's really a privilege and a great opportunity for us to be able to grapple with, with the questions and think about what the election means to us to have the opportunity to have you both here with us, is in your mind, 
what does this election represent? What does this election, election 2020, tell us about our country? And I'll ask uh, Dr. Berenbaum to start us off. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I think essentially the presidential election is over. I think it will take time for that to sink in, but I don't think there are any legal paths um, ahead for the president. I think um, our, we have very basic, uh, very basic elements. We are a polarized country. And the question becomes whether there is anything we can do to mitigate against polarization. We are facing, to my mind, five crises simultaneously. Clear, and everybody agrees we're facing a health crisis, which has gotten worse in the past weeks rather than better. 10 million ill, more than 100,000 a day. And it's happening not only in the United States, but across the globe. We face an economic crisis because of the consequences of the COVID crisis. We face a social justice crisis uh, in which segments of the population feel that there is not justice in the country for them. We are facing in California uh, and throughout the world, uh, what I would also say a climate uh, crisis. Let me say that I have no authority to speak on a climate crisis but I am the uh, brother-in-law of the former scientific chief of Israel's EPA who tells me there is a climate crisis. But if we consider the forest fires in California and on the West Coast, if we consider the hurricanes and we consider the fact that it was 70 degrees up and down the East Coast yesterday, we have a climate crisis. We have a leadership crisis. And, the, and we have a crisis of polarization, precisely polarization at a moment when at least with regard to the health issue, the only way out is if we all pull together. And um, pull together meaning my wearing a mask protects you, your wearing a mask protects me. We're all dependent on the heroic efforts of medical professionals. We're radically dependent on the ability of scientists to innovate for a vaccine and on the pharmaceutical country, uh, uh, companies to manufacture it. And then for all of us to collectively be ready to get a vaccine. And therefore I don't envy the man who is about to become president of the United States. And I don't envy the country he is taking over, but that's our existential situation. Let me take the other side just for a moment, um, which, which is, I think, amazing when you think about it. I, I would imagine that most of the people who are joining us tonight uh, watched uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris uh, give their speeches, uh, might say Shabbat. Uh, I don't know exactly when, when uh, Shabbat ended uh, in LA, but where we are, it ended perfectly, you know, boom, uh, and you and then turn, turn on the computer and there's the uh, statement of a, a resolution, it seems to me, or at least the beginning of a resolution of one of these crises. But I actually think that what we saw on Saturday night and what we're seeing across the country right now is a demonstration that, that we are stronger, our institutions are stronger, they are more functional than anyone thought. I, I mean, there was a great deal of speculation on both sides and a lot of it very conspiratorial and very dark and, and very apocalyptic that this election could never take place, that President Trump would subvert it somehow, or on the other hand, that the deep state would somehow work to undermine President Trump. We couldn't possibly have a, a, a safe election in the midst of a pandemic. We did it. And, and really there should be some gratitude for that. Uh, we, we passed through changes, uh, radical changes in terms of the way that we distributed ballots and. Uh, got things out, and we just had the highest participation in terms of uh, 
uh, percentage of eligible people who actually came and voted or sent their votes in and marked them in. And two thirds of the people who voted, a little bit more than two thirds, sent in mail ballots. But this was the highest turnout since 1900, not 1908, as has been previously, day, all the way back to 1900. And that was McKinley and Bryan the uh, second time. And uh, the di big difference there is women didn't have the right to vote at that point. They weren't eligible. So in modern history, this was the best turnout we've had. Now, God willing, uh, some of those 100 million people who didn't vote will vote in the future. But the fact that America operates, that trash gets picked up, that the police do the heroic job that they do, that the medical professionals do what they do, that we just had the announcement today from Pfizer that we have a vaccine. I, uh, I do think we'll look back on, on this time period, the last several years as a dark time with lots of problems. But I, I think that the, the message here is that the country uh, is durable and, and survived. And, uh, and actually may emerge from this sort of long, wobbly stagger through a dark tunnel uh, to uh, greater light and strength and, uh, and satisfaction for, for all of its citizens and a, a greater role in the world. That would certainly be my hope. So, um, so I guess you could say that we live in the you know, in the worst of times and the best of times, and uh, glad you know that you're that you're sharing that optimism, Mr. Medved. I think we're all in agreement that it's a you know deeply deeply divided and polarized country. And just so if we can take from your opening statements, which were both you know interesting interesting perspectives, of course. So so where do we go from here? Um, you know, we'd like to think, of course, that there's a strong and bright future for the United States. You know, during the course of this uh, hard fought election campaign, you had, you know, half the country felt that the opposing candidate will bring this country to ruin and destruction. And the other half felt that the other opposing candidate is going to bring the country to ruin and destruction. And there's such divide and such tensions. So with, with the crises, but with the sense of optimism, what, what, what could we do? You know, what are, the, what are the ways that we could bring the country together? Uh, let me uh, respond in a couple of things. Number one, I have, Rabbi, you know that I have both affection and respect to you, but given what I study, I never say it's the worst of times. <laughs> so let's, I, I, I've never used an analogy to those times and I've never said, I will never say it's the worst of times. Thank God it's nowhere near the worst of times for the Jewish people. But having said that, I, I want to agree first of all with um, Michael Medved that uh, our institutions have proved durable and um, we weren't guaranteed that. Uh, I think the first thing is we, and, and this uh, may be an advantage of uh, President-elect Biden, which is we have to tone things down. Um, we've been living as it were on all sides from crisis to crisis, from agitation to agitation. And if Joe Biden is boring, that may be a tremendous blessing for the country. And the other thing is if we rediscover a certain measure of stability instead of in instability, that may be a tremendous measure, of the, uh, a tremendous blessing for the country. Where we go, uh, I think that we have to all tone it down and find common ground, uh, even um, uh, because we have to figure out that, that if we go in the direction of polarization, it's going to split us apart. If we go in the direction of what we share together, it's going to bring us together. And I think that may be one of the um, calls that we've had in this, and uh, if we achieve that, then we've achieved something significant. Um, the interesting thing about the uh, vaccine today um, is that the, that was not an achievement that Pfizer knew itself. That was an achievement of an independent uh, medical body 
that reviewed the evidence and called the chairman of uh, the CEO of Pfizer yesterday at two in the afternoon. By the way, the CEO is an interesting fellow. He's a Greek Jew um, uh, who, is, who is a CEO, a product of Salonika hmm. and who uh, ironically um, uh, was raised um, in Salonika and the product of its uh, school system uh, and uh, certainly would not be speaking uh, Yiddish and would not be speaking Farsi but certainly uh, can speak fluently the language of the Svardim uh, throughout uh, uh, the world. So um, there's an interesting story there, but the reality is that, that it offers us hope that there will be a light at the end of the tunnel with regard to the medical crisis. But I think we should also say that's a global medical crisis, which is disturbing the medical systems throughout the world. And um, if, if I can just add to what you're saying, one of the amazing things about the development of this vaccine, which if the claims are true, really is a nace. I mean, it's an unbelievable miracle. If it's 90% effective, uh, that's better than anyone had hoped for. It's developed largely with German money, and it's a cooperation between the uh, German sources and scientists and apparently Americans and this uh, uh, Ladino speaking uh, scientist with roots in Salonika. What a miracle it is. Think about the time we live in. It, it, tonight it's, is the 82nd anniversary of Kristallnacht. Uh, my mother and her family got out of Germany in 1934, thank God, so before Kristallnacht. But we live in a world where Germany's closest allies want Germany to spend more on the military. Think about what that means. I guess it's an unbelievable thing. Where, and Germany, by the way, is a very good example, modern Germany. Uh, Germany, even since reunification, if you want, is a very good illustration of something that relates to what you said about uh, Vice President, President-elect Biden, which is boring is often greatly underrated. Uh, Germany is kind of a boring country. It doesn't get involved in a lot of destructive stuff. Now, the previous hundred years, another story. And, uh, and, and I do think that, um, that part of what you were saying, Rabbi, when you're citing Dickens, the, the uh, epigraph for, uh, for Tale of Two Cities, it says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And right after that, and this fits better, it was the age of reason. It was the age of foolishness. And we have plenty of both in, in America today. I, your question, which I thought was a great question, is what do you do? And I honestly believe, particularly when you look back at this election, even the entire year and the year before that, the last two years, this country has been plagued, the United States, by Sinat Chinam, by a completely causeless hatred that just seems to be free flowing based on nothing and in every direction. Uh, do I think that the president contributes President Trump to fomenting some of that? Absolutely. Uh, do I think it's re remedial, remediable? I, I do. And it's as Rabbi Cook said in his famous Devar Torah, you have to answer sinat chinam with ahavat chinam. You have to feel at least some kind of deep uh, maybe sometimes unjustified, but causeless, visceral, instinctive love for your fellow Americans and try to express it and try to, to live with it to counteract the toxins that are out there. You know, I, 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 I guess it's, um, it's a time for us to emphasize the Talmudic passage, which says that we follow Hillel over Shammai because Hillel made sure to formulate the argument of Shammai before presenting its own. And it's very, very interesting that they, obviously that's, it's something, you know, I'd like to think that the more we speak about it in terms of listening to the other, respecting the opinion of the other, even though you might disagree, but at least to, to respect the other person, if you're gonna argue passionately, argue, but argue nicely. Um, I, just, I just wonder, you know, I, uh, it's just been so divided. And in a certain sense, it's like out of control, don't you think? It just in, in our community, in the country, out of control. 
Um, sometimes I have to admit, when I, I wrote an email last week to the shul and when I speak about listening to the other and respecting the opinion of the other, sometimes I feel like, you know, for, for the people who know that it's not necessary to hear it. And for the people who, you know, for many people, it just won't matter. So um, I, I just hope that we could somehow uh, come to lower the rhetoric, as you said, and uh, listen to one another. Um, and uh, so let's move, let's, if, if, unless you want to share an additional thought, I, I'm, we, let's move from the, from the United States. Of course, we continue to talk about the United States, but to the, uh, and that, that is very, very promising, encouraging news about, uh, about the vaccine, which we're all hoping, hoping and praying as we, you know, as we prayed over the course of the high holidays, right, to take away this plague from us and to protect us from it. Let's move from the U.S. to the American Jewish community, because like there's, you know, two Americas, you have, you could say there's two Jewish communities or two Jews, three opinions. So maybe it's at least two Jewish communities. You know, the news outlets have reported that over 70 percent of American Jews voted for Joe Biden. And among Orthodox Jews, according to estimates, more than 75 percent voted for Donald Trump. I believe in our modern Orthodox community, it was, it's more balanced, although I haven't done a survey, but that's one divide. Another divide is between the United States and Israel, right? In terms of more than two, more than two thirds of Israeli Jews support Trump. Trump is very popular in Israel. Um, and for, for understandable reasons, as our community knows and is appreciative of. So more than two thirds of Israeli Jews support Trump. And more than two thirds of American Jews, as I said, support Biden. So what do you think, uh, Mr. Medved, we'll start with you this, this one. C can, we, can we speak of a Jewish community as a united community? Uh, are the, and, and are there any steps? What, what are the ways forward for the, for the Jewish community? And, and can we talk about a united Jewish community? Or are we just you know, irredeemably split? When did we ever talk about a united Jewish community? I mean, uh, the, the at Harsinai was was when we were we were actually facing death uh, in uh, uh, in Jerusalem uh, with the Romans surrounding us, and we were killing each other over trivial, relatively trivial political and religious disagreements. Now, uh, again, the the need to feel some kind of instinctive love, rather this instinctive resentment. Uh, what's the old joke of uh, various congregants uh, ready to literally commit murder over whether you're going to do a second Yukon Purka? You know, and, and um, it's, it's unfortunately been a problem for the Jewish people. And uh, the, the one thing that I, I think one, one can say right now is that The, the one thing that is most needed is um, getting more American Jews familiar with Israeli reality. Uh, when that Pew study came out about American Jews, the biggest stunner to me was the idea that at most, at most 25% of self-identified Jews in America had ever been to Israel, ever. And that's appalling. The numbers are higher in some evangelical Christian denominations where they put a premium on actually going to Israel. I was speaking to my brother who made Aliyah 35 years ago. This morning, I actually had him on my radio show because he was featured in the Wall Street Journal. I'm very proud of him. He's my kid brother, Jonathan. And uh, uh, John was saying, He's doing all these deals right now as a venture capitalist. He's doing these deals in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. They have 20 million tourists a year in the United Arab Emirates. Israel is lucky if they get 5 million. Uh, <laughs> there's just nothing to see in Abu Dhabi except sand and some really snazzy buildings, new buildings. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I think is most important in trying to bring American Jews together, uh, many of whom don't even think they believe in God, uh, is, is actually having some kind of connection with Israel, which it's tough to do from, uh, from a distance. So well, that gets us into, you know, thinking about why, why many American Jews support President Trump, 
right? And there, there are many, many Jews who say, oh my gosh, how can you not support President Trump with the way he supported Israel? So it's interesting that, um, you know, bringing, bringing us together is through the commonality of, of the state of Israel, but yet um, maybe we'll get to that in a moment in terms of, you know, the Trump administration being a great friend to, to Israel um, in terms of, of course, uh, you know, moving the embassy and pulling out of the Iranian uh, nuclear deal and helping broker those historic accords with the Sunni Arab states. And so this just, that's just, just an interesting piece there where um, in terms of many, many will say that, you know, how, how can you not support, how can you not support President Trump if you really do have an identification with Israel? Just maybe, Michael, you want, Mr. Medved, you want to follow up on that? Just okay, piece let, before me, get to let me say it very now. quickly. I, I think I can give an answer very quickly. And this is something that, that over 70%, um, they're, they're arguing about the uh, uh, exit polls. And it may be that uh, President Trump did uh, as well as Mitt Romney did. Mitt Romney got 29% of the Jewish vote, which was historically high. President Reagan got more than that when he was running for a second term, but that was a time when he carried uh, 49 states. In any event, the, the one point that I think for that 70% who voted against Donald Trump would say is that if you care about Israel at all, one of the most important things, and I wouldn't say one of the most important things, the most important thing for Israel's security and survival is a strong, healthy, united, United States. And uh, if the lights go out in America, and over the last several months, there are people again on both sides who've been worrying that the lights would go out, out in America, what is Israel supposed to do? Uh, because it's a dark and hostile world. There's not a, a great deal of affection for Jewish people, except in this wonderful country. And, uh, and fortunately, we have in the United States, there are a lot of non-Jews who believe that part of the blessing for America uh, follows uh, Sefer Breshit, where it says that those who bless you will be blessed and those who curse you will be cursed. If, if this country loses its way and is racked by civil war of any kind, whether it's a cultural civil war or an actual physical struggle, uh, the impact on Israel would be devastating. Let, let me let me uh, weigh in, and I'm going to be the apicurus uh, in in the equation. Uh, first of all, I think for um, the number of Jews, let, let's let's agree that it's seventy thirty. Uh, I think it's probably higher. Uh, Israel was not the central issue. The central issue was the nature of America. Right. And the fear that we were losing something about America, that the very basic um, norms of American society were being destroyed. America's role in the world was being transformed. And uh, we were losing the traditional allies. We were closing up to... Um, authoritarian regimes, um, and there was uh, perpetual chaos. Let me also uh, argue that American, uh, I, I want to say something which I shared earlier about the embassy, and I, I'm going to insulate myself from attack by saying I have a particular commitment to the unity of Jerusalem. I was one of the people in 1967 who physically unified Jerusalem, meaning I drove a bulldozer and a garbage truck that knocked down and picked up the rubbish from the Mandelbaum Gate. I lived in Jerusalem when it was a divided city. I was part of the group that um, physically united the city. I was not a fighter, but I literally knocked down a, a fence and to the joy of a, a a teenager, but to the shame of an adult, uh, in the process of doing that, I demolished uh, several cars in the Arab sector, but that was um, a little bit of the acting out of a teenager. Let me say, I, I was pleased that the United States recognized the embassy. I was deeply displeased by how much uh, it meant to the Jewish community. And the reason for that is Jerusalem has been the capital of Israel for most of the uh, 72 years 
of Israel's existence. Anwar Sadat spoke out of the Knesset in Israel. Jimmy Carter spoke out of it. Henry Kissinger negotiated with the government in Israel. If we establish our own capital and we maintain a parliament there, and we have a president's home and a prime minister's home, it's not important to us who recognizes it. We have created the reality. Ben Gurion once said it's less important what the Gentiles say. He used the word game at that point. It's more important what the Jews do. And the recognition was sort of a, a feeling of it. Uh, so I, I was a little bit less, less impressed with that. The feeling of the Jewish left, uh, and this has been, and, and we'll take it that it was vindicated by the recent um, events, was that if annexation was to take place and a, um, Ju uh, the Israelis were to essentially take hold and unify the territories, there would be the creation, ipso facto, uh, of a binational state instead of a uninational, instead of a Jewish state with an Arab minority. And that was bad news for the Jews over the long-term future. That's a long and complicated argument, but the idea that we have to essentially, and I don't think it's a peace process, I frankly think it's a divorce process, that as ultimately we have to divorce from a significant segment of the Palestinian Arab population in order to maintain Israel as a Jewish democratic state. Let me say one more thing about the, the uh, recent agreement. First of all, it's a misnomer to call it a peace agreement because these countries were never at war with Israel. That doesn't mean it's unimportant. It means essentially that for the last half dozen years, uh, a little bit, uh, and especially the last several years, Israel has had a strategic alliance with Sunni Arabs against Shiite Arabs. And part of the question, and this will impact Muslim anti-Semitism, is when will they tell their people, when will they tell the children that they are in, es uh, in essence uh, allied with Israel and the recognition, and Israel also controls two very vital commodities that it never controlled before. We see negotiations going on between Israel and Lebanon over um, nat natural gas and oil, which means that they have to establish a recognized border between them in order to divide the spoils. And secondly, Israel has achieved something which is extraordinarily miraculous in terms of the entire history of the Middle East and Jewish history, which it is that it has achieved uh, the ability to make water a non-issue within the country. And it is prepared and equipped to, to provide water to the Palestinian territories, to provide water, and it is providing water to Jordan, and it will eventually be equipped to provide water to Saudi Arabia. And those of you who saw uh, the big short Remember uh, at the end, the guy who understood the whole mortgage crisis of 2008 and profited from it, what was he investing in? He was investing in water. And no country, no country that, um, no country that, um, that supplies water to another country declares, water, uh, declares war on its water supplier. And that's a very significant breakthrough. Let me say one more thing, which is gonna make me equally unpopular um, with some in, in your congregation. Let's face it, Israel has its own problems of division that are enormously significant. Three elections without a result, probably a fourth election before it gets a functional government. President of Israel has declared, said, we now have not Am Yisrael, but Shiftei Yisrael, not the nation of Israel, but the tribes of Israel. And what I would say is that Israel has achieved something beyond our imagination, but something radically different than we imagined, both in the greatness of what the achievement has been, and also in the uh, enormous divisions 
within society, which we're seeing every day. I can only tell it to you in the most personal perspective that when I were, was writing to my sister and speaking to the people I speak with every day because I do business uh, with Israel, uh, their comments about Israeli society rivaled my comments about American society. And I say both of them as an American, as a Jew, I say both of that with tears. I, I don't, uh, I actually don't disagree with anything that you said, Michael. I mean, and I think it's, uh, and I actually think what I've said about the uh, strength of our institutions having been put to a very real test in this election cycle, and we were, uh, that's, uh, the jury's still out on Israel's institutions. I mean, they have a political system uh, that is dysfunctional. Uh, I, anytime you, you run the same election, that was the Groundhog Day series of elections for Israelis uh, with each one. And, and now the, uh, uh, the new polling shows that Naftali Bennett is the most popular choice apparently for a prime minister. And I think he's a remarkable leader. I think they have- Well, let's say the least unpopular. What, to think that Naftali is a remarkable leader? No, no, no. you said the most popular, I would say the least, <laughs> the least popular. Right, right, right. I, that's fair enough, good correction. Uh, but it's, it's, um, it's clearly, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to figure out what to fix first. You have a real problem with uh, integrating, and that's something I was just reading that uh, uh, Naftali Bennett has been trying to focus on is integrating Haredim into the job market, and uh, but first into the army, which is clearly something that the overwhelming majority of Israelis think is important, and apparently increasing numbers of Haredim recognize is important. Look, fortunately, um, uh, we don't we don't have to cope with that level of political crisis and whatever the next crisis is going to be here. But the, the importance of, um, of the embassy move, it seems to me, is sending a message, uh, not of Israeli exceptionalism, but the opposite of uh, Israel being a nation among nations because I do not know of another nation in the world or in the United Nations or recognized at all where that nation doesn't get entire discretion for selecting its own capital. And uh, the, uh, uh, the idea that this was uh, some area where you single out the only Jewish nation in the whole world, that's the one which has an ancient capital that has been there for 3,000 years, and that's the one where the United States is going to hesitate about actually moving no. uh, an embassy to the functional capital. I think that's correcting an oversight and a slight, and I think it was good for uh, Israel spiritually and uh, emotionally. Dr. Dr. Let me just add, a couple of people have asked, and we should address it. Uh, Biden is not going to change the embassy. That that um, that uh, train has left the station. He, he says, said it repeatedly, and it's, he said it's, he it's, said it's, that he fine. said that rep repeatedly. And we also should point out that it was quite remarkable the um, lack of response within the Arab and Muslim world to the establishment of Jerusalem as the capital. That signaled that. Um, those who feared something else um, uh, were wrong. Let me touch on one other question, Rabbi, while we're at it. Um, I don't, I, I think that uh, I've known Joe Biden for um, 35 years. Um, my wife worked with him uh, and the like. Uh, Biden is of the generation of Democrats that A, he knows Jews intuitively grew up with Jews, has Jews as friends, uh, knows bar mitzvahs and weddings, and most especially shivas, um, and um, has a, a, an intuitively wonderful feeling toward Jews. 
wonderful feeling toward Israel. And he will, um, and he took, uh, I, I know this from discussions, he took each of his children, uh, I'd have to say each of his adult children, because he had a daughter that was killed as a, uh, as a young child, took each of his children to visit concentration camps to teach them about that. Uh, and that's something he did in the privacy of his own uh, life. So I'm less worried about him. Let's talk seriously, though, that we have a problem of younger generation leftist Democrats with regard to their relationship with Israel. And that's some, and most especially um, with the, um, and we saw this, for example, with the um, squad, with the with one instance of the squad that's more important than any other, which is AOC had agreed to speak at a session in memory of the 25th anniversary of Yitzhak Rabin. And she backed out of it. Now, if you can't speak at a session with Yitzhak Rabin, who made peace with the PLO, and who uh, essentially had that symbolic handshake with Yasser Arafat, and who changed his many of his views and who paid for it as Anwar Sadat did with his life. A Jew cannot go to a memorial service to Anwar Sadat or somebody else can't go to a memorial service for Yitzhak Rabin. It says an awful lot about them, an awful lot about um, their own hostility toward Israel. So we have to face that, but that's not Biden. And it's also not something that we're going to see in Harris because uh, of the role that she has to play. Look, the prime minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu, right, he noted the warm and personal relationship he has with Biden for over 40 years and also called him a great friend of Israel. I think maybe on people's minds. And by the way, I'm not I'm trying to make sure not to reveal, you know, uh, my, you know, I'm trying to stay out of showing support for any particular presidential candidate. But I think there's a concern among some members of, of our community uh, in the sense of you know, who Joe Biden would surround himself with, number one, as you just made reference to the, to the squad. But the second thing is that the Joe Biden was the vice president under Barack Obama and, uh, and Prime Minister Netanyahu had, you know, I don't know how you describe it, a bitter relationship oh. with, uh, with the President Obama. So I think there's some real concern among our community whether the U.S.-Israel alliance is going to be as strong as it has been the last four years. And I'd like to turn it again in terms of, you know, what, what do we have to do as a community? I mean, either way, we have an obligation to do everything we can to ensure that there's bipartisan support in Congress, in, in the U.S. for you know, for, for this relation, for this alliance. But I think that's a concern, Dr. Berenbaum, about Biden in terms of uh, serving with Obama and who he's not. Uh, let, let's, be, let's begin. That's the least of our concerns. Biden is not, Biden is not going to surround himself. He owes very little to the ultra left. He beat them. Uh, the idea that Biden, people called Biden a socialist or said that he was for, um, uh, Medicare for all or anything like that. He ran a centrist left campaign. That is where he is instinctually. The candidates for Secretary of State, uh, including Chris Coons, uh, whom uh, Michael Medved knows uh, well, candidates for Secretary of State are not on that wing of the Democratic Party. We have an obligation as we have a responsibility as a community that the Jews on the left have to fight both anti-Semitism and anti-Israel attitudes on the left. And the Jews on the right have to fight anti-Semitism on the extreme right. And also have to fight the whole range. We all have to fight together the whole range of conspiracy theories that are going to become that have become common in the last years. And the one thing we can be helpful, uh, we can be thankful to Biden is that Biden will not fuel those flames. Now, I don't want to say President uh, Trump, um, President Trump was understood by the extreme right as fueling those flames and recognizing uh, those forces. 
And uh, that's a dangerous thing. It's easy and cheap for me to criticize anti-Semitism on the right, but I'm invested in criticizing anti-Semitism on the left, which means I have to oppose people who come from my natural political leanings. And I think the same has to be said of anti of anti-Semitism on the right. If I, I'm just something that honestly would make everyone who's listening to us tonight feel good. I mean, and we should all feel good. Uh, Kamala Harris, who uh, is not nearly as well known as Joe Biden, hasn't been around as long. One of the first major speeches she gave when she was elected to the United States Senate and she took her seat in 2017 was her speech at APAC. It's about 15 minutes long as APAC speeches are. It's really worth listening to. It's, it's profound, it's emotional. Uh, it's a very reassuring speech. And uh, I mean, aside from the fact that as people know she, her husband is Jewish, uh, her only two children are her stepchildren from her husband, uh, Doug. And, uh, and I, I think it's, it, it is, Okay, it's stupid, but it's a little bit endearing to me that she tells people uh, that she she taught her stepchildren to uh, pronounce her name correctly by saying it's Kamala. It rhymes with Mamala. And uh, okay, and, and by the way, there's this other thing which I, I hope it, it'll be very controversial. But I'll, we are now going to have two United States presidents in a row. With That's Jewish grandchildren. Yes. Can you imagine? I, once upon a time, people said, uh, you know, who is a Jew? Someone who's capable of having Jewish grandchildren. So uh, I'm not saying that we can count Joe Biden and a minion as a minion. But I heard a story that he came for a Shiva minion at one time, not realizing for a constituent that he had known, not realizing that he couldn't be, be counted as the 10th man. Well, but... Let me tell let me tell a story uh, that Joe Biden, let's take one more thing. Joe Biden is one of the most decent human beings you can ever know. Uh, a woman died on Friday by the name of Janet Salter. Her husband, uh, Sonny Salter, was the mayor of Beverly Hills in the 70s. I was uh, at their home when Max Sonny Salter was dying. We got a call that the vice president of the United States would be visiting. He sat at his bedside for an hour and a half and rubbed his feet because Max Salter was an old time friend of his and a, um, an old time friend of his and an early supporter of his. His plane was delayed for him going back to Washington. Luckily he had his own plane. There's a fundamental decency about the man and I'm hopeful that that fundamental decency will communicate itself and will quiet down some of the bad uh, vibes we have had in this country. And I think the difference, and let me say it with both Obama and Trump, Obama, um, President Obama was at his best aloof. And President uh, Trump was at his normal angry. And here we're gonna have a guy who at his normal is both calm and caring. And character does count. And I think at this moment that will be helpful. That we can disagree about policy, but I think temperament will be enormously helpful at this moment. I think it's reassuring, Dr. Berenbaum, for me and probably for all of us to hear about the decency and the character of Joe Biden and also what we spoke about earlier in terms of his support um, and friendship of Israel. Um, by the way, I think it's okay, you know, it was mentioned by both of you that something you, you'll, you'll say is going to be controversial or provocative. I think that to me, that's one of the takeaways from tonight, which is that we're fine, especially at Beth Jacob, we're a big tent, we're a diverse community. We, can, we respect others, even if they might think a little bit differently than, than, than myself or us. And so it's, we want to hear another perspective, even if we might not have thought of it in that way. And so we, we want to hear provocative. We want 
You want to hear something that might be a little controversial? Of course, if you believe it, and I'm sure you do believe it when you say it. So that's that's all good. That's that's part of the problem of, of the moment that we have right now in this country. Um, uh, everyone I know has, uh, on all sides of this presidential campaign, has us uh, had either destroyed or damaged friendships, friendships, long-term friendships, because of these disagreements. And uh, and and I just, I honestly think realistically, if you look at the policy differences, which we see as so vast, they aren't. The that's what is is so bizarre about this campaign. We're not arguing right now about war or peace. We're not arguing about saving the union. We're not arguing about the evils of slavery. We're not even arguing about a major war. The Vietnam War, when that was polarizing, when, when I was in, in high school and college, the, the Vietnam War, we went up to 400 dead Americans a week, a week. And that's, that's extraordinarily different from arguments about how you're going to fund uh, medical care, or um, basically, basically the sorts of nonsense that I think is, has clouded our American vision to be unable to see that there are people on all sides, very enthusiastic supporters of President Trump, who are noble people, who are doing wonderful things, and very enthusiastic supporters of uh, Vice President Biden, we're also superb human beings. That, 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 that needs to be recognized. Yeah, I, 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 fully, I fully agree, of course. And I think, you know, what, what you're saying is basically we have to do more of thinking about what, what we have in common and our shared goals and what brings us together as opposed to what divides us. And I think it gets into us doing more maybe as a Beth Jacob community, as a Jewish community, and uh, thinking about building bridges with the other, <laughs> you know, of thinking how our community could build bridges with uh, other faith communities, other ethnic communities, I think uh, you know the only way to overcome you know the the racial tension, the racism and, and xenophobia, is by human cultural interaction, and the human interaction can really break down stereotypes. And you realize that these are human beings, and you could hear the story of another, and then you realize that you have a lot in common, and then you have some differences and different narratives, and then you have to grapple with it. So, I think it's a lot about you know what the elections mean to me. You know, and what, what we can do about it is to try thinking about what brings us together, that we do have a lot in common, um, and to try to work harder to build bridges with other, with other people, with other communities. Uh, let me, let's touch on a couple of, um, let's touch on a couple of things that are in the chat room. Um, one of your people said that Biden appears to be very fragile, easily controlled by others. Um, you know, President Trump tried to make that and turned out to be a mistake on his part because he set the bar very low for Biden's performances uh, in the debates. And he certainly looks like a man who is uh, in charge of himself at this point. He also stood his ground very, very well and very strongly throughout the primaries. He won on his terms and that says something. The second part of that question is uh, the larger picture is China and then influence on our, on our country. This is gonna be a major issue. China has now become our most powerful rival economically in all sorts of other ways. And the question becomes whether we want uh, essentially uh, how we want to work with China and how we want to engage uh, China. Uh, let me say that we made a terrible mistake, and this was one of the more skillful moves of the of the um, Obama administration was to establish the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, which was essentially bringing in all the trading partners to counterbalance the weight of China. We walked away from that without really considering that. Uh, BB, uh, somebody said, uh, BB, uh, Biden has called BB chicken, and I won't pronounce the last word. Uh, le let's also say a couple of things. Uh, Biden was humiliated in Israel, and if it was any other country, he would have left immediately. 
and that is the day he arrived in Israel as part of the processes, the um, uh, one other segment of the Israeli government announced the expansion of settlements in extreme way. President Obama was embarrassed by Bibi. And in fact, uh, any other country, the ambassador would have been considered persona non grata because he accepted an, an invitation to speak to the House of Representatives without speaking to the State Department or the President of the United States to oppose the policies of the President of the United States. Let's ask the question about the Iranian agreement. And here again, I don't want to pull rank, but uh, I do have uh, another brother-in-law who's fairly high up in the Israeli security apparatus. I do not know what he does. And um, that doesn't help uh, our discussion. But um, the Israeli security apparatus, as the American uh, apparatus, was uh, not quite convinced that um, the um, agreement was not useful. It wasn't going to protect Israel forever. But Iran is much further along in two possibilities now than it was four years ago. Number one, it's much further along in, in obtaining an atomic bomb. And secondly, and this is part of the consequences of our withdrawal um, of, of our weakening in the Middle East, it now may have a direct landline from Iran to Iraq, to Syria, to Lebanon, which would give it a warm uh, port on the Mediterranean. So the question of how we deal with Iran and how we control Iran is a very important question, but I don't think it's a one-sided question. And I can tell you, last point, because I, I can tell you from my work, which is, which is very interesting. Let me talk about two things about my work. Number one, um, I have books that have been translated into Farsi that are available on the internet for free. The easiest money I am ever able to raise are people who will sponsor my work, who sponsored the website of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Farsi and the like, because the irony about Iran is that the people are more pro-American than anywhere else in the world, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world. And we have to maintain contacts with segments of Iran if ever that regime is gonna be overthrown. Okay. And I, ha I have, Look, I, I, more books I, translated into, into Farsi, and I waive all my rights on them immediately. I, right now, the, the, the New York Times ran a, a piece of all of the things that Joe Biden has promised to do in his first 24 hours as president. Yes. Now, it, it's, it's an ambitious agenda. Uh, some of it he can actually do and should do. Uh, it seems to me it's a reasonable idea to rejoin the world climate accords. I mean, to rejoin the Paris Accords with 170 other countries, yes, why not? Uh, and it also seems to me a great idea in, in terms of reigning in China to uh, re rejoin or to actually submit to Congress to confirm the uh, Pacific uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which does not include China, it is all of China's rivals. It's Australia and uh, South Korea and Japan and the Philippines. And of course we should do that. Look, I, I hope that he does not follow through as a top priority um, uh, re-entering the JPCA, the, the Iran nuclear deal, because it's extraordinarily complicated. And right now, um, I, I from what I understand, there are celebrations in Tehran. They're very, very happy that Trump is going away. The one advantage that I think uh, President-elect Biden can bring to his role would be consistency, would be uh, actually determining a policy and sticking with it and then not firing people in the middle. The president fired the defense secretary today, today because the defense secretary, Mark Esper, is gone and he was terminated. And he was terminated because he disagreed with the president about the 
need to deploy federal troops and possible violation of the Constitution uh, to put down civil unrest following uh, the death of George Floyd. And uh, the, I, my hope is that uh, Vice President Biden will select outstanding people and no, he's not going to select Elizabeth uh, Warren. And you know, Michael, why he won't select Elizabeth Warren. He couldn't get her through the Senate. And, well, be able to, and, and there's a Republican, there's a Republican Governor, governor of Massachusetts. Correct. Charlie Baker, the seat. Who, who's the most popular governor in the country, is a Republican of Massachusetts, and he would. And the played. second, and the second most popular is Larry Hogan. Larry Hogan in Maryland. Absolutely, who wrote a great piece today in the Wall Street Journal, precisely about how we can begin to get along as Americans again. Look, um, I I believe that one of the things that Americans feel exhausted about is not just the the disagreements uh, among Trumpers and anti-Trumpers and Bidenites and uh, people within the partisan political realm. But I think the American people are exhausted of conflicts within the White House and within the Trump administration. And I, do, I really don't want to see any other books from former top aides to President Trump uh, basically condemning him and exposing him. That's a genre that I think is played out. And let's also say that Biden ran a very stable campaign. One issue. One with, issue. And with, and, with, and with people who have been around him for many, many, many years. So, Dr. One of, one, one of your people, let me respond. One of your people said that the Democrats, if they get 51, are going to uh, invoke the 25th Amendment and install Kamala Harris as vice president. As president. Let me say... First of all, there are any uh, half the centers in the United States on any given day look in the mirror and see a future president of the United States. And they all believe that uh, the men, as they're shaving the women, as they're combing their hair, that they are looking at the next president of the United States. Nobody in the Senate who imagines themselves as the next president is going to want to give Kamala any higher step up toward that office than she has right now. And, um, and by the way, it is statistically impossible, assuming uh, that uh, Dan Sullivan in Alaska wins, and right now he's getting 64% of the votes, and assuming that Tom Tillis, who is ahead more than two points in North Carolina, wins after the ballots finally come in. In North Carolina, state law allows them to send in mail ballots up until they can arrive up until Friday of this week and still be counted. That's why North Carolina hasn't been pulled. But Tom Tillis is going to win and Dan Sullivan's going to win. What that means is that even if the Democrats win the two seats in Georgia, it's 50-50. And I don't believe that Kamala Harris is uh, able to, uh, uh, to uh, decide a tie in her own behalf. And if you actually read the 25th Amendment, you first would require the vice president and half the cabinet to sign a document saying the president is incapacitated. And uh, God willing, I don't think that's an eventual. Mr. Mr. Medved and Dr. Berenbaum, I wanna start winding down. I received a, an interesting question via the chat just to me privately. It happens to be from a, a past president of Beth Jacob, but I'm not sure if he wants his identity revealed. He has an interesting question. Um, that we're a deeply divided nation in part because of our philosophical differences regarding the role of government, but in large part because we cannot even agree on the facts. How do we approach the problem that we get our news from different and often very biased sources? I think that's a great question. It's just so hard to know, you know, you know where are we getting the truth because the, the media outlets are, are very biased in one direction or the other. Any thoughts as to, is it a particular, you know, how do we deal with this issue about the trouble and question of facts? And do you have any specific recommendations as to as to where we where we should get our news from? Let me, let me add the let me add the problem uh, that the younger generation doesn't read newspapers and gets virtually all of their information off the internet. Uh, I, I have this with my son, uh, my youngest son, all the way through where I, I pick up a sports article to want him to hold a, a newspaper in his hand. Uh, 
my view, my view very simply is we all have to get our news from multiple sources. And we have to also um, go back to um, um, the great newspapers of the United States, which um, do not answer the needs of the hour, but at least grapple with the needs of the day. The problem, the problem with all of the cable news is you probably have a good hour and a half of news that is dragged out for 25 hour, 24 hours and magnifies any of the issues that are involved. And it's virtually predictable what everybody's gonna say about it. One of the things that I sometimes like to do, and I'm gonna do this in a meeting tomorrow is uh, I'm, I'm going in, into a project in which I'm gonna articulate my critic's point and my critic is gonna articulate my point and then we're gonna put it to a committee. And, when it's gonna, and the, the end result is to make about a $2 million decision on that. But the important point is to be able to understand what the other issue is and too many of us have become thoroughly predictable. And, you know, I see, it, I see it every day where I can tell where the sources are from uh, and, and the like. And I read multiple newspapers. I read right-wing newspapers and left-wing newspapers. I read uh, Israeli newspapers in Hebrew and in English. And oftentimes you see that there's a little bit of a different news in English than it is than there is in Hebrew. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, entirely agree with, with one important addition. Of course, the, the most basic source for news is the Michael Medved show uh, every weekday afternoon at noon uh, <laughs> and uh, available easily on the internet or for download 24-7 uh, or actually just download for 24-6. Uh, though, though people who do want to download on Shabbat also do that. But, um, and michaelmedved.com. Um, but I, uh, I do think that uh, uh, reading two newspapers, I make it a point every day to try to read fairly meticulously both the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, we're very fortunate right now because the writing in both of them, and I would add, and the writing in the Washington Post at this fraught, difficult moment in our country has been superb. I mean, they're, they're really, almost every day, there are bits of columns or in-depth articles that can teach you something. And uh, they are a great source of news. And, and by the way, and the New York Times just passed a milestone where they now are generating more revenue uh, from their online edition, which actually has more stuff. And, uh, and I think that is a, a much better opportunity. I agree with what you're saying about uh, cable news entirely. And it is all uh, on, on every side, so incredibly one-sided. And it is something that I try to do in my, my own little way that's different, is that I very regularly have people on as guests with whom I disagree. And, uh, and it is possible to respect people with whom you disagree. And uh, so, but I think that the, uh, whoever the questioner was is entirely correct. It's very, very difficult to get straight stories. Uh, and and I, I do understand that that is something that the incoming administration is going to try to work out is a, a less adversarial uh, relationship. It's bad for the country that every single press opportunity, we're told that so-and-so is fake news. And we all know that the president has his likes and his dislikes about the way that people cover him, mostly dislikes. And, uh, and a lot of it's been unfair, but um, the, the idea of having a situation where the leader of the free world is openly hostile to the institution of a free press which Thomas Jefferson thought was more important for the survival of a free society than the government itself. Uh, it seems to me that's something that will change for the better. All right, so uh, Mr. Mr. Medved and uh, Dr. Berenbaum, thank you so much for this 
fascinating and thought-provoking conversation. Um, as you see from the chat box and you see people are really engaged in sharing their passionate thoughts and perspectives about the matter, but I think it was really enlightening for us um, to hear you know, everything that you had to share. And I, I wanna thank you so much for sharing your time and, and expertise. But I, before I end, two things. Number one, the questioner, um, the mysterious questioner gave me permission to reveal his identity as Dr. Steve Tabak about uh, how to get our, you know, from where we should get our news and the bias in the media in all directions. That's from Dr. Steve Tabak. And thank you for your thoughtful responses to that. And number two, let's end the conversation. I wanna thank everyone for joining, but uh, maybe end with, a, with a th 30, 20 to 30 seconds from each of you on something that you fear and something about which you're most optimistic. And, um, and, and, we'll, and we'll end with that. I wanna thank everyone for joining and thank you both, but let's hear just to, to end it a, what, what do you fear and what are you most optimistic? Maybe like 20 seconds for each of those. I fear the conspiracy theories and the targeting of, the, of Jews in those conspiracy theories because uh, conspiracy theories have often targeted Jews and Jews make themselves a very good target. And by the way, if, uh, if it comes out that the president of Pfizer is, uh, the CEO of Pfizer is Jewish, and if it comes out that uh, they indeed, God willing, develop the vaccine, I am uh, agnostic. Anybody who wants to develop the vaccine is fine enough with me. You will then read that uh, they develop the virus in order to develop and profit from the vaccine. What do I uh, look forward to? I look forward to um, many days in which I'm bored silly by the stability uh, in Washington. Uh, and uh, I wonder what happened to the good old days uh, when you used to have to watch the news three or four times a day, figure out who's in, who's out. I hope it becomes boring. I bless uh, anybody who goes into the Israeli army I say, may you have a boring period of service. That's my final blessing to all of them. May we have four years of a little bit of boredom in which decency prevails and tranquility prevails. Amen. I, I have an immediate fear about uh, the next 10 weeks. And uh, it, it is very, very important that some of the good people, some of the normal people around the president, and there are some very good people around the president, uh, help him uh, to do the right thing here. He, uh, he confirmed this afternoon, uh, it was right after I went off the air, that it was confirmed. He's planning to start doing rallies. And he's planning to start doing rallies to uh, basically expose the election as a hoax. And they're now talking about trying to force a whole national revote. I had Steve Bannon on my show. Uh, I am not a fan of Steve Bannon. And by the way, I think there are particular Jewish reasons to be a non-fan of Steve Bannon's, but uh, he's talked about a color revolution in America, which means like the orange revolution they had in Ukraine where the streets are just flooded with people to uh, try to undo the results of an election. Uh, it, America's not gonna fall, we're not gonna collapse, we're not gonna have a civil war, but it's very destructive. And, and this goes to the whole point you were making about conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories undermine your success, they undermine your happiness, they poison your life because they render you powerless. If you believe there's some in, invisible cabal that is running the whole world, whether it's Jewish or not, then that renders you helpless. And what do I hope for? I hope for a normal inauguration. Uh, I hope for a transition. I hope for a divided government which works exactly the way our inspired founders meant it to work, which is that you have different centers of power that are able to block <laughs> the rival centers of power from doing something really insane and destructive. Uh, it's. Um, I cite my most recent book, God's Hand on America. I cite uh, the fact that, 
that Joe Biden, and the book was written before he announced his candidacy, and it was just, he was leaving as vice president, and he used to use this line, which was a variation on the Bismarck line, uh, God gives special protection to drunken Irishmen in the United States of America. And uh, he was asked uh, by, uh, I think it was Adam McGurney of the New York Times, uh, Mr. Vice President, do you still believe that uh, after what just happened in this election, Trump was coming in, Biden was never a fan of Trump's. Um, and he said, well, I'm not sure about the Irishman, but I'm sure about the country. And may we all feel sure about uh, this blessed land, this Malchus Shal Chesed, the United States. Okay, we'll end on that uh, that note about uh, the United States of America being a Malchus Shal Chesed and Rav Moshe Feinstein, whose son Rav David Feinstein just passed away, another great leader. Uh, so Rav Moshe Feinstein once said that we have to be so grateful um, and that it's uh, out of gratitude that we have to be involved in the democratic process and to vote because uh, you know we have to do everything we can to protect our, our freedoms that we have in this country to observe our religion without interference. And, and so, uh, and he, so Rav Moshe understood, and we all understand uh, that that comment, Michael, that you just ended off with Machlos Shel Chesed about how blessed we are to live in this country. And thanks for ending off both of you with this sense of optimism. So thank you all very, very much again. Thank you, Dr. Berenbaum, Mr. Medved. Really, really a wonderful conversation and uh, so happy to have the opportunity to hear from you. Thought provoking. We're gonna to continue to argue about the things. Let's make sure though, uh, to argue nicely and to listen always with respect. Lila Tov, Mr. Rotovot, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. What a pleasure. I just wanted to pack it up. No, I didn't. No? No. no. So it's like a good conversation. Really? Could you go on that day? No. You go on that day? No. Oh. What's this thing? I thought that was. I thought you were in How many people are you in favor of this one? I don't know. They were expecting about 80. Can you turn it off? Lila Tov, everyone. Lila Tov. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. Michael, again, Lila Tov, thanks so much. Great seeing you and talking with you. Oh, I'm so pleased you set this up, and it was a pleasure. I'd never met uh, Michael before, and uh, really? it was just great. Wonderful to work with him. Okay. Oh, really? That you never met before? Great. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So maybe Thanks. a new friendship in regards to Diane. You bet. She's right here. She was sitting. Okay. She's my computer engineer here. She was taking care of the logistics. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All the oh. very best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.